So I think what where Sue was going was to talk about the timeline for the use of central IRBs in the United States. And I think this is one of the things that as we were working through the city project, we found um, really very interesting. Um, and I think it's a piece of information that is something that a lot of people don't realize is that central IRBs have actually existed since the late 1960s. Um, so the first U.S. independent IRB was actually established in 1968. And so when we think about the use of central IRBs in the United States, people have a tendency to think about this as being something that's relatively new and innovative. Um, but the reality is it has existed for, for quite some time. Um, and over time, there's been a lot of additional information. Um, so if you look at the, the slide here, in 1999, the NCI formed their central IRB. Um, AHARP was founded in 2001. And then you can see increasingly over the last decade, there's been a lot more um, you know, uh, information and drivers around the use of central IRBs, whether it be through uh, the project that we were doing with City, the NIH, um, you know, the notice of advance, the advance notice of proposed rulemaking around the common rule, um, and all that information. And so this issue of central IRBs has really become uh, a, an important one. Uh, next slide, please. So. What is the rationale for central IRB use? Well, the rationale for central IRB use is that in a multi-center clinical trial, full review by each site's institutional review board may not enhance the protection of human research participants. Um, and the idea being that, you know, what is the real value added by all those additional IRB reviews? Obviously, there are times when there are um, differences in IRB review and that Sometimes things get called out. They may not have been called out by another committee. But really, at the end of the day, generally speaking, across the United States, most IRB reviews, um, the additional review doesn't really add much value. And the FDA and the Office of Human Research Protections and Health and Human Services really support the use of central IRBs for multicenter clinical trials. And we've given you some of that guidance below. Next slide. Hi, Cindy. I'm back on. OK, great. Awesome. <laughs> All right, thank you for taking over. Um, so, it, just briefly, this is a, um, a FDA regulations regarding the device and the use of local IRBs. Uh, Cindy will go to this um, in detail in her section, but there is a provision that FDA re regulated medical devices, there's a provision that each study needs to be submitted to a site's local IRB, this is the institutional IRB, if there is one. Um, we know that there are many um, medical device companies that utilize a central um, central IRB, and we don't know um, the the importance of this provision. However, um, there was a recent House of Representatives bill that was passed uh, on 21st Century Cures Act at, in July of this year, which requ um, requests this the strike out of the word local IRB from the mention of this um, statue. And then we, we don't know how it's going to uh, or when it's going to move forward to the Senate. But it is an interesting context, and uh, Cindy will go through about the institutional review piece, which we believe, um, you know, th this may, may be one of the considerations around the local IRB process. Um, next slide. The city project, which Cindy and I had an opportunity um, to lead, we, it, it involved uh, two pieces. And the first piece was really um, understanding the, the there is this openness to use a central IRB for multi-center clinical trials. But when we started the project, we also knew that there were many uh, sponsors and institutions really still not ad uh, adopting the use of uh, central IRB for multi-center trials. So, really wanted to understand what are the perceptions of the barriers that are out there and predominantly from institutions, institutional officials, uh, various stakeholders in, a, um, in different uh, types of institutions where they could provide us with feedback around these barriers. And we had um, several expert panel meetings where we um, collectively received comments around uh, what those barriers were, and we had a, um, a solution base. Let's identify some solutions to those barriers. And, uh, and then we had another meeting to uh, provide those results to the, um, to the, to the community of um, participants. Next slide. 
So one of the common themes, and it, and it's this this will resonate with people who've um, conducted research for a while. I think everyone. Um, believes that they understand the term of central IRB, um, but in our context, uh, we really clarify what it means to uh, to have to be a central IRB. So our definition of central IRB was really not um, not an independent or a commercial IRB, but it's a single IRB of record for all sites that are involved in a multi-center protocol, and that was one of the common themes that. Many people thought they were using a central IRB process if they had a relationship with a commercial or independent IRB, but I think from this project is using a single IRB across all the um, different sites that are working on the particular clinical trial. So in, in this example, a, um, a federal IRB, an institutional IRB, or an independent IRB could all serve as a um, central IRB. And then um, the other themes, and this is, we'll go, uh, Cindy will go through that in detail, is really around the other institutional responsibilities, uh, not just the ethical review of the protocol and informed consent and other uh, components of research, but really around um, other institutional resources or components in which um, an IRB serves that function in a particular institution. And then there was a common theme that uh, generally, most people who weren't uh, experienced in using a central IRB really lacked experience and un didn't understand how this might be implemented in their institutions. Next slide. So we came up with um, the project recommendations. This was, uh, we went through a several process of gathering scientific data um, and doing the, a, a structured interview, but really we defined the use of central IRB as I mentioned, a single IRB of record across all sites, and that um, the blurred distinctions between the responsibilities of a, a ethical review versus an institutional review, um, we recommended that sites uh, and IRBs use a city develop, uh, development guide. It's called a considerations document. We have a link to it off the city website and also references to this site that really provides a aspect of what are the responsibilities of a IRB versus an institutional review, and it provides a consideration of all parties involved. And then lastly, which I think is uh, very important for sponsors, whether you are a industry sponsor of research or federal or state or local government uh, or even patient support groups sponsor of research, that any of those um, sponsors require the use of a, of a central IRB, so a single IRB for review uh, for multi-trial networks in order to, for people to gain experience with a central IRB project. And that will help with the level of discomfort in what this might look like in using a central IRB model. Next slide. So this is the consideration document. It's pretty comprehensive. Um, it really, you know, does, uh, really lays out the responsibilities of an institution, the IRB, or both, and, and walks, um, walks the institutional officials of the various considerations around the process. So we think this is a very useful tool. Um, Cindy will talk about some other tools that have been developed as part of this project. Next slide. And then we have two uh, publications. One is on the right is a literature search of um, the use of central IRBs in the United States, a literature review. And then the one on the left is a plus one um, article that really goes through the process of the first project in terms of how we went about in interviewing the different institutional officials and institutional stakeholders around this process, how we came up with the perceived barriers and the solution uh, to those barriers in implementing the use of central IRBs. Next slide. So what I'd like to share, I, I think this will be um, helpful, is kind of my personal experience in implementing this process back in 2010. Um, I, I joined Celgene uh, in 2011, and um, prior to coming to Celgene, I worked at Pfizer, and I implemented um, with my team the central IRB process at Pfizer, and I had a very different experience at Celgene. 
I think one of the challenges of implementing such a, um, a novel concept is that there's, even at a sponsor uh, piece, so there was a lot of reservations. I think everyone uh, wanted the IRB review process as a sponsor of research uh, to be hands-off and not to dictate to any institution that you must use a certain IRB that a sponsor has selected. So it took a lot of um, education, information, um, a lot of, you know, just not taking a no for an answer in various functions where um, that this is okay to do as a sponsor and that they, the different uh, groups that had concerns could be part of the process in selecting an appropriate independent IRB that, um, that Celgene as a sponsor can use, um, incorporating not just the research and operations piece, but legal and quality assurance. So we went through a very rigorous process. Uh, this project was managed internally by the Global Site Contracts Group, which has the most uh, contact with an institutional study startup process. And we used the city recommendations. It was extremely helpful, especially with those um, functions that didn't think that this particular aspect of study startup could be influenced um, to provide credibility that a sponsor could recommend a, uh, an IRB for the trial. We came up with an implementation plan. We had a very robust RFP process and a selection process, and that part of that selection process included, you know, a lot of the quality assurance um, and discussions around conflicts of interest between the, uh, the business side of the IRB versus the ethical review side. Uh, once the IRBs were selected, we uh, have a master agreement and master informed consent. We negotiated those. And then we had a communication plan with our sites. Uh, we partnered with the IRBs to make sure that this was well communicated to the institutions that were um, receiving this information. Let's go to the next slide. So some key takeaways. I think communication is really key. Um, you know, the internal stakeholders, there will be folks that, um, you know, really know a little bit about the IRB process and may um, provide some resistance to um, implementing uh, this, this initiative, but um, it does help to have city as a, uh, a well-known uh, well institution to um, provide those recommendations. We provided um, letters and information on letters on how we went about in selecting the IRB and how they could work with the IRB. Uh, we made sure that our uh, vendors, our uh, contract research organization and vendors were aware of the, uh, the selection and how to work with these IRBs. Uh, we did a lot of train the trainer. We made sure that there was a subject matter expert at each of the line functions and that there was uh, leadership. And then we spread the communication uh, not just to the people who are uh, responsible for study startup activities, but those um, individuals that may have um, contact with an institution, whether that be the uh, regional medical liaisons or um, the, the site monitors that, that go out so they could get some feedback around um, how this is being received at the institution. The other thing that's been very helpful is the relationship with the IRBs. Um, this was a very positive experience that um, we've had, um, we, and I've had at Pfizer as well, where you have, um, as a sponsor of research, a opportunity to have an open dialogue with an IRB, with people who really are experts in the protection of human subjects. So that was always a good um, way, because normally if you sponsor a research, you wouldn't n normally have that um, relationship. So if you go to the next slide, we were able to use this um, IRB relationship as a, a means to get advice, get, co get counsel, become, um, and have our, the IRB chairs of these independent IRBs, um, get, you know, ask them for some guidance around different, um, different questions that come up. They, they became a, a good sounding board. So things around subject reimbursement, which, you know, everyone had different perspectives, but at least we can um, ask the questions to the, um, the IRBs around uh, their thinking and approach, around pediatric studies, around assent and consent, how, that, that, how their thoughts were, and then the informed consent process. 
The other thing which I think when you, as a sponsor, when you have a relationship with the IRB is that you also get an opportunity to get feedback on the, your draft protocols and other documents. Um, that line of communication is so important and it's a, it's a good way um, if a, t a study team in your company have certain questions um, to get that, those questions and feedback from an IRB early on in the process. Uh, we have built in a routine performance evaluation and review of the various performance metrics that we have built into the agreement. And uh, we also predefine some, the distribution of work between the selected central IRB so that uh, we don't have any bias in terms of providing more work to a, a, an IRB. So as a company, we selected three IRBs and we make sure that um, the distribution of work is based on the expertise of those IRBs, uh, the members that sit on those IRBs. And we also get feedback from our CRO partners and sites how their experience has been in working with these independent IRBs. So the key takeaway for me is um, the sponsor adoption. It does take, um, it does take effort. Uh, it's one area where um, that people don't want to get involved and they want to uh, follow the traditional process, but uh, once you take on the challenge to um, implement this process, it, it does help the entire system and, and it could change the paradigm of uh, using a single IRB for multi-center trials. So with that, I'm going to hand things over to Cindy, which she'll talk about the tools that have been developed as part of the advancement of the central IRB project. Thanks so much, Sue. Um, do you think you could try to pass the slide presentation to me and we could, and let me see if I can advance the slides? If possible. Sure. We're, We're giving it a try right now. Okay, awesome. I just think it'd be a lot, a lot easier. Okay, great. So, okay, looks like it's working. That's great. So, you know, when we got to the end of the first project, and, and Stu, thank you so much, you did a great job um, tossing this to me and setting it up. What it really came down to is we started doing presentations, and we started going out there and presenting all this information. And what we got back from all parts of the, the ecosystem around central IRBs and, and clinical trials is, what do we really need? So even if I want to do this, what, what do I need? How do I actually do it? Um, and so we started to look at those questions in, in a lot more detail. And one of the things as we started to think about next steps is that UNC, um, the University of North Carolina, their Human Research Protection Program, conducted a pilot study um, and had, had been also doing these presentations at Primer and at other uh, organizations where they were looking at the quality of review by central IRBs. And they did this by um, conducting a study in which they compared the review of, of, uh, of, of central IRB review versus local IRB review, and looking, um, in this case, looking at, you know, it, it not only was, was the quality good, but also um, did it really actually make a difference, right? At the end of the day, one of the things, one of the things we want to make sure is that we are, we are uh, improving efficiency in the clinical trial infrastructure. And, and did it actually do that? And one of the things the, U the UNC study showed us was that there were time savings of approximately 20 days per trial, but only if a master services agreement was already in place. And this to us was very telling. And so we went back to the UNC folks and we said, what do you really mean? And they said, well, there's a little to no advantage if there's not a standing agreement in place. So if a central IRB was to come to an institution with a study and that institution did not already have an agreement in place with that central IRB, you actually lost the savings that you were generating as a result of using central IRB due to protracted contract conversations. And I don't think that should be a surprise to anybody on the phone, right? Um, you know, I think sometimes the, the IRB has always served as like the big bad wolf in the room as, oh, it's taken so long because of IRB review. Um, and once we kind of, you know, in institutions in which IRB review has now been streamlined, everybody's like, oh, everything takes so long because of the contract, right? So what UNC really showed was that there was this question about IRB authorization agreements and, and how long that was taking. And so we came up with a second follow-on project because for anybody on the call who's part of City, you know that your job is never done. Um, <laughs> City loves to kind of say, oh, what's the next step? Um, and we said, we really do have next steps here. Um, there were remaining areas of concern. 
and people were really concerned about the how-to. And so in 2013, we kicked off a, spec a second separate city project known as the Central IRB Advancement Project, where we were looking at some of those additional areas of concern, like what about local context? Um, you know, people would say, well, I want to be able to use central IRBs, but I have all these local context concerns. So what were they, was that real or was that a surrogate for something else? Um, and then what about example IRB authorization agreements? What were people using? Why was that contract conversation taking so long around IRB authorization agreements? And we kept hearing from institutions, I'd love to be able to do this, but I have no idea how to actually do it at my institution. Um, other institutions would say, how do I know that that IRB is good? Um, sponsors would say, how do I know which IRB I should use? Uh, kind of the project that, that Sue was talking about. And if I'm a sponsor, can I really require my sites to do this? Are people gonna just run away from me and say, you know what, I'm not gonna do, uh, do research with you anymore? So these are some very real questions, um, and there were some very real practical questions. And, and I often like to say in my role as Chief Operating Officer, I'm sort of like the, uh, you know, the queen of paper, the chief bureaucrat in charge. And so these are the kinds of things that, sadly enough, really get me excited um, to go to work in the morning. <laughs> so uh, you know, we decided to tackle some of these hard operational practical issues. So what did we do? Well, we held a couple of webinars, um, and during those webinars, we talked about the sponsor perspective, which, which Sue did. We talked about the research institution, institution perspective, which is my perspective, um, which is really, you know, what institutions need to do. We also then put out a request on the IRB forum for those individuals who are familiar with that. That's a, a forum that's existed for, for a really long time, for about 17 years. Um, and it's a place where IRB folks go to ask questions uh, to other IRB folks about how to get things done. And we asked them, uh, we said, hey, can you send us your template IRB authorization agreements? Um, and we asked the IRB community who allow use of and service central IRBs to send us their IRB authorization agreements so we could get a better feel for what people were actually doing out there. Once we had those IRB authorization agreements, we held an expert meeting, and then we developed some recommendations from that meeting. And this is what I'm gonna walk you through right now so you can get an idea of, of what, we, what we were doing. So under the IRB authorization agreements, we wound up uh, basically collecting 16 template IRB agreements or waivers, which we reviewed to determine the kinds of clauses which were included, so we looked at what were the kinds of clauses that would be included in those IRB authorization agreements and then the frequency to which those clauses appeared. So if someone had a section about scope of responsibility, did it appear in all 16, did it just appear in two, that kind of thing. Um, what kinds of IRBs and human research protection programs responded? Um, as Sue said earlier, we define a central IRB as the IRB that comes with the study. Um, and so we had, and those can be lots of different kinds. So we had institutional IRBs, commercial or independent IRBs, so those would be IRBs not otherwise affiliated with an institution, IRBs associated with a federal sponsor, and IRBs associated with a clinical trial network. And you can see that these numbers uh, add up to more than 100 because some organizations actually serve more than one role. But it was a pretty good representation of uh, the sort of IRB industry. And one of the first things we did is we said, okay, what were the clauses that were included in 100% of all agreements? So, these are the only things that appeared in every single agreement. And I should say that there were 72 clauses. So at a total of 72 clauses, the only clauses that appeared in all agreements were the name of the reviewing IRB, name of the institution, a general statement of reliance, scope of the agreement, and signatures. That is pretty disheartening. Now you can see where why it takes so long for IRB authorization agreements to get negotiated because at the end of the day, people, couldn't, people don't even agree on what should or should not be included in an IRB authorization agreement. Where if you think about the time it takes to negotiate a clinical trial agreement, and yet, generally speaking, the clauses, the, the topics addressed are pretty much the same across those agreements. Um, the language may differ, but at least we all agree what needs to be in them. Turns out in IRB authorization agreements, the community is very divergent on what even needs to be included in those agreements. So in June of 2014, um, about a year ago, we held an expert meeting, and this expert meeting included representatives from the FDA, from OHRP, from the NIH, 
from industry sponsors. There were device manufacturers there, uh, pharmaceutical companies, uh, institutions, commercial IRBs. It was a very significant meeting um, where we discussed examples of organizations who have adopted single IRB of record for multicenter clinical trials. We talked about local context. We talked about we talked about the operational models, and we also obtained feedback to refine the proposed template. And all of this discussion led to development of what we're calling the evaluation checklist. Now, I know it gets a little confusing. We have the considerations document, the evaluations checklist. Um, but those things used in concert together are the kinds of things that I think are very helpful when evaluating use of central IRBs in this context. So while we were in the process of taking all of that information from the expert meeting, um, which really represented this consensus group across the enterprise, the NIH comes out with a draft policy. On December 3rd, 2014, many of you may be uh, aware of the fact that the NIH came out with a policy that said that it would require use of single IRBs for multi-site research um, in, in most cases, um, and that the use of a single IRB would lead to enhanced protections to minimize institutional conflicts of interest and to refocus IRB time and resources towards the review of other studies. And this was great for us, right, because this really validated our prior work in which the uh, city had said, we think sponsors in a position to do so should require central IRB review. So the NIH took that and said, yeah, we agree. Um, regarding local context, they gave some, some more information about that. Um, the draft policy proposes that NIH-funded institutions will be expected to use a single IRB, and exceptions would only be allowed if the designated IRB is unable to meet the needs of a specific population or where local IRB is re review is required by other law. And this is the part where it got very interesting for us. As we're sitting here and we're all working academically to develop these tools, this guidance, the working through the practical things, the, the comments to the draft policy start coming in. Primer, um, which as many of you probably know, is the preeminent uh, organization, uh, professional development organization for human research protection programs, said, uh, the NIH must develop tools, guidance, and best practices to help facilitate the use of single IRB review mechanisms. We were like, whoa, we're doing that. Model reliance agreements, standard operating procedures. Sounds an awful lot like what we're working on. Uh, the AAMC, roles and responsibilities of all sites must be clearly and explicitly defined before institutions will be confident in the ability to seed or take on IRB review. We thought, wow, that's the considerations document. Um, institutions will need more guidance on how to choose a single IRB and whether this decision, when this decision needs to be made. Wow, that's the evaluation checklist. Um, and finally, guidance should be clearly should clearly define the role and responsibilities of a single IRB of record and that of an institution with concrete suggestions for implementation. The Society for Clinical Research sites, and again, that's exactly where we were working. So we were very excited about this because we feel like we were actually three quarters of the way there. And so what are our actual recommendations that came out of this project? And these were um, unveiled at the April ACRP meeting um, where we were able to present out um, exactly what our tools and guidance that have been recommended from our project. So the first one is that the city recommends the use of our uh, city-developed evaluation checklist. And there are three sections to that checklist. One is for institutions, one is for sponsors, and one is for organizations serving as a central IRB. The institutional uh, checklist is an institutional self-evaluation, which asks if you're considering adoption of a central IRB model for multi-center clinical trials. So it's general considerations. So what should the institution be thinking about when it's trying to decide whether to adopt a central IRB model? The second checklist is it's sort of after. So you've decided to use a central IRB, and what do you need to consider both as an institution or a sponsor in evaluating whether or not to use a specific central IRB. So whether it's you're contracting with a central IRB or you're using um, or you're agreeing to accept the central IRB for which the sponsor has contracted with, what are some of the things you need to think about? Um, and finally, the last one is if you're serving as a central IRB. So whether you're an institution or commercial IRB, what are the things you need to know about the site? So what, what do you need to understand about, about that site? And all of this is talked about in the evaluation checklist. The second recommendation is that to address administrative and legal concerns and to reduce time when first executing a reliance agreement, 
We recommend that institutions and IRBs adopt or begin negotiations with our, with our IRB authorization agreement template. And that's because it really does represent a consensus document across all of the individuals who are at our expert meeting. Um, you know, as I said before, there were, there were uh, representatives from, from the government, from the regulatory agencies, from uh, sponsors, from institutions. And this, in our opinion, represents if not the language itself, you can always tweak, but at least the clauses, the sections that need to be included, right? Those kinds of things. Um, this, this really was, was a consensus around what really needed to be included in that, and we thought could speed up that process of uh, IRB authorization agreement negotiation so that the efficiencies that were identified in the UNC pilot project, which was a very good study, um, could really be realized through use of a central IRB. And this is our IRB authorization agreement template. It's up on the city website as well as the evaluation checklist. And I think provides people with a lot of the tools that they would need in order to actually make this happen. Uh, the third recommendation, and this I feel like is always the red herring in the room, um, to address local context concerns. We had a lot of conversation around local context. And what we really came down to was at the end of the day is that the Secretary Advisory Committee on Human Research Protection Programs uh, has really already taken this up. They put recommendations out there, um, recommendations on considering local contacts with respect to increasing use of single IRB review um, in January of 2013. And those recommendations really should be followed. And there was no, um, we didn't feel like we needed to add anything to them. We didn't feel like there was anything um, missing from those regulations. Um, and so we said that institutions really, um, regulations, those uh, recommendations that institutions really should, should review them and should follow them. Um, finally, our recommendations four and five, as I said before, uh, city never really finishes. <laughs> we recommended that additional research be conducted to further define quality. So we spent a lot of time talking today around efficiency in review um, and how to make the clinical trials process more efficient, but it still doesn't completely answer the question of quality. And that's something that had come up uh, repeatedly. You know, how do I know that it's a quality review? You know, I know something might be faster, it might be more efficient, it may feel better, but is it, but is it actually better? Um, and, and how do we quantify that, whether through qualitative or quantitative data? Um, and then we also recommended that research be conducted to develop data and technology standards across IRB application systems to facilitate communication. So if if you're an investigator or a sponsor and you have to utilize multiple electronic systems that are asking you the same questions in a different way, that can be difficult. Um, and we really need some standards around that in the same way that we talked about standards around the IRB authorization agreement. So we have lots of tools that are out there. Um, all these tools are available um, on, on the city website and you can see the, the link down on the bottom. Um, so cityclinicaltrials.org. Um, our briefing rooms and tools, all these tools are available. They're publicly available. We encourage everyone to go and download them, review them, use them, um, ask us any questions about them. Um, we think the more people use them, the more they get refined. Um, so it's sort of a, uh, you know, kind of a crowdsourcing activity in many ways. Um, so, you know, please do review them and provide us with feedback. So one of the things I'm often asked is, how do you do it? So I know there's a lot of people on the phone are from sponsors, but as you're working with institutions and institutions are kind of reluctant to do this, what do they need to do? Well, you know, you need to consider are all kinds of studies open for reliance? Would they accept any IRB? Um, if they're accepting a commercial IRB, are they more comfortable with a single commercial IRB that the institution is contracted with or with the IRB that comes with the study? And these are the kinds of things that institutions are thinking about. Um, what establish your goals and deliverables. As with any change management, what's your desired outcome and timeline? Um, do a stakeholder assessment. Identify your champions and your naysayers and everyone in between. One of the things that I found was really interesting as we were working through both projects is you would anticipate or you would think that the people who would be the most um, because they're excited about use of central IRBs would be the investigators of the sites themselves and that you would see more resistance, let's say, in the central offices. And my experience personally has been that the um, resistors are actually the investigators because the way they look at it is it's like, oh, it's some other new way of doing things. And you know what? I'm happy with the way I know. 
you know what, I know Mary in the IRB office, I know who I call, I'm just going to call her, don't make me do something new. Um, and so, you know, you kind of need to figure out who those who those people are um, and really start uh, kind of a, a grassroots campaign in many ways. Um, develop your project plan. Think about who, what, and when. Um, and define metrics. You know, what does success look like? Is success getting every single site onto use of a central IRB? Are you comfortable with 50%? You know, where, where are your defined goals and metrics? And, and once you do that, I think that's helpful um, in sort of uh, driving the project forward. I mean, I think, you know, a, a common statement, right, is how do you eat an elephant? Um, and it's, you know, one bite at a time. And, and I think that's important, right? So don't bite off more than you can chew. Figure out what your goals and metrics are, and then and then really drive towards those. So just to give you a little bit of an example, um, this is where I work. I work for the North Shore LIJ Health System in New York, and we're a 19 hospital health system. We've got about 2,000 projects, and until recently, I'd say within the last five or six years, we were really reluctant to rely on a central IRB, but we currently rely routinely, um, and we do it in a couple of different ways. Um, we routinely rely on central IRBs, and I think when you're having conversations with institutions, whether you're at an institution or you're a company having a conversation with the institution, one of the big questions that people always ask me is, so how did, did your, did your human research protection program or your IRB, do they have less work to do? Um, and the answer is no. Um, it hasn't lessened, but it has changed. So one of the things that we are very careful to do is I don't call my quote unquote IRB office an IRB office anymore. Um, I call it a human research protection program, which is in line with the accreditation standards, AHARP, and, and all of those parts of the, you know, the ecosystem. Um, and, and I think this is really important because resources have now been deployed in new ways. Our focus within the organization is more on the oversight of study conduct and implementation, regardless of IRB utilized. So we've taken those resources that may have been previously devoted to a process, like a committee review process, and we've actually deployed those resources now out into the clinical space, actually helping the investigators get their studies up and running, monitoring the conduct of the study, and really kind of um, moving that project forward. And I think that that, that is a better use and a better way to protect human subjects when you are actually on site um, kind of seeing what's happening rather than sitting in an IRB office, you know, and processing some paperwork um, or sitting in a committee room and talking in theoretical terms as opposed to actually seeing the way that it gets implemented. And I think that's a really good sell for institutions. Um, again, we talked about this, um, resource allocation and deliverables, accepting reliance on an external IRB allows the Human Research Protection Program to focus on consultation for riskier studies, vulnerable populations, implement informed consent monitoring, et cetera. Um, so practical tasks, what do you need to do? Well, the first thing we needed to do in our institution was to educate the institution about institutional responsibilities versus IRB responsibilities. As Sue mentioned earlier, lots of organizations have placed what are institutional responsibilities within the IRB office, and they'll say things like, oh, we don't sign our contract until we have IRB approval, or we don't, we don't issue, or we don't issue IRB approval until the contract's done, or we don't issue IRB approval until, um, you know, it's got radiation safety approval, or we don't issue IRB approval until the conflict of interest review is completed. When you flip this around and you accept IRB approval, very often the protocol's coming through the doors of the institution with IRB approval in hand. And so all of that kind of changes, right? So educating the institution about what the institution needs to do and how those resources need to be deployed is important. Um, the other important thing that we talked about in our institution was reviewing and revising all our institutional policies and procedures. So for an example, we used to have a policy that said the investigator may not proceed without approval from the North Shore AJ Health System IRB. It now says the investigator may not proceed without approval from an North Shore LIJ Health System authorized IRB committee. Change things like contact the IRB office to contact the Human Research Protection Program. We've also, um, you know, one of the things we also struggled with and had to figure out was who has the final say? Who gets to say, yeah, this study moves forward? Um, and that's, you know, when you take commercial IRBs or central IRBs or IRBs from another institution and we start accepting that, et cetera, sometimes changes that decision. Separating policies was really important. So as a sponsor, 
there may be things that you are looking at um, and thinking, well, what are your what are your IRB policies on obtaining informed consent? Well, actually, that's an institutional responsibility, and the institution should have policies on obtaining informed consent. What are your IRB policies on training in the conduct of human subject research? Well, actually, again, that's an institutional responsibility, right? Compensation for research subjects, review and management of COI, storage of data. These are kinds of policies that institutions must have, should have, regardless of whether or not they provide IRB review. These are, you know, these are good, good clinical practice. These are GCP-related things. And so these are the kinds of things that um, when I'm looking to serve as a central IRB or when I'm working with another organization, I always say, well, what are your institutional policies around these issues. It's a little bit of a red flag for me if they only have IRB policies around these issues and they don't have institutional SOPs or other ways of, of sort of conforming to GCP. Um, and then you need to establish the business model, define the workflow, evaluate costs, establish and publish. We establish and publish an HRPP fee structure and we communicate this and educate our grants and clinical trials office. So I just said, just because IRB review is going away doesn't mean institutional responsibility goes away. And so there are still costs to the institution when you utilize a central IRB. Now, what we've done is we have separated those costs out. So um, other kinds of reviews that are required may have a fee associated with them. Um, so it is, it is cheaper to use a central IRB, I'll be honest with you. Um, from our institutional perspective, from our perspective. Now, what the sponsor pays the central IRB is between you and the IRB, um, but from our perspective, you know, we, do, we don't charge the same rate, so the IRB fee versus the HRPP fee are different, um, but we do have an HRPP fee structure when utilizing a central IRB. And we build this into our budgets at study startup and administrative fees. Um, and I think you know, I mentioned AHARP a couple of times, and for those of you who don't know what AHARP is, it's the, you know, the Association for the Accreditation of Human Research Protection Programs, um, and it's really sort of the gold standard for organizations conducting research with human subjects. And AHARP does a really good job of separating out an HRPP from an IRB, and they say that, you know, distinctions of a quality program for HRPP include a strong integrated plan, strong program for scientific review, a strong and highly motivated organizational leader, a program for review of resources for the HRPP, research-specific IRBs, one of, one of only two places where they specifically mention IRBs, a strong network of communication among units, policies and procedures, we just talked about that, strong quality improvement programs, strong educational programs, highly competent IRB chairs, members of staff, and impressive educational materials for the community. Many of these things do not exist inside an IRB committee, but they certainly exist inside a strong human research protection program. And I think that that's a really important distinction. Um, so in summary, uh, I think what we've really found is that full review by each site's IRB may not enhance the protection of research participants, and use of a single IRB of record for multi-site trials is supported by the federal and regulatory funding agencies. Um, with single IRB review, research sites continue to provide important oversight of the research conducted at their institution, and they do that through um, their human research protection program. And organizations really do need clear, uh, organizations, sponsors, and uh, IRBs need clear IRB authorization or alliance agreements that define the roles of the central IRB and the research institution so that there is not confusion um, and that those can be uh, sort of cleanly and quickly executed to still continue to realize the efficiencies towards use of central IRBs. I want to thank uh, my central IRB advancement team. Besides Sue Bang and myself, Petra Kaufman, who is now uh, at NCAP at the NIH, um, is also one of our, our co-team leads. Um, our city project manager, Sarah Kelbert, for anybody who works at city, everybody knows Sarah is amazing. Um, and my team members, which include individuals at UNC, Quorum IRB, WERB, uh, one of my colleagues here, the FDA, a patient representative, um, and Andy Womack from Genentech. And so um, with that, I will turn it over to any questions. Well, thank you, uh, Cindy and Sue, for a very informative and, I think, uh, very helpful presentation webinar on uh, central IRBs. 
Well, people are um, getting online here, and just to remind you all that you can submit questions via chat. I had a couple questions that I'd like to just uh, follow up on. And for, obviously, the Medical Device Innovation Consortium is focused on medical devices. So when you look at um, unique aspects or considerations for medical devices, could you maybe uh, describe some of the, the topics or, of discussions or unique considerations that came up in the context of uh, medical device technology research versus pharmaceutical um, uh, research? Yeah, hi, this is Cindy. So, so I can talk a little bit around some of the, some of the unique uh, things that kind of came up, and, and one that I think was, was really interesting um, and was very specific had to do with um, when you, it was an interesting question, and we didn't really have a good answer for it. So I, I don't know if this may, it's just an interesting thing for people to think about. But medical devices obviously are very different than pharmaceuticals in that many medical devices are actually implanted into uh, a human subject. Um, and when you have a, let's say, central IRB review and you're using a commercial IRB, it may be very important to consider the viability of that commercial IRB um, business model. Um, the reason being that uh, the uh, length of time that you need to consider follow-up and long-term care of participants who have an implantable device make it difficult to switch IRBs midstream. And we really hadn't thought about that much, um, but when we were at the expert meeting, a couple people had brought that up, and it recently came up again at an AHARP conference. Um, you know, and so, and so really looking at the, the viability and the business model of the IRB you're using was very important for, for other, uh, for people in the device industry. Interesting. Yeah, that's a very interesting point. The other thing that I hear quite often is devices are different because there's not only the question of the delivery of the therapy, but there are the procedure-related innovations that uh, also um, need to be considered. You know, how do you respond to that uh, that point. I'm sorry, can you ask the question again? Yeah, so with devices, you have the, the therapy that's being delivered by the device, um, if you will, but you also have the, the risks uh, and the, the variability of approach of the, of the procedure. And uh, how do you um, address that point when you talk about central IRBs when maybe there's different uh, approaches or um, levels of accreditation for people for different procedures in different hospital systems. Right. So this really gets to the, the question about local contacts, um, the issue of privileging and credentialing, and, um, you know, even even sort of surgical approach, right? So what is yep. someone, yep. one organization or institution surgical approach to something as opposed to another's? Um, yeah, so, so that really does become this local contact question. And I think this is an important consideration um, when you are working through the um, IRB authorization process and the selection and the site selection process. So again, um, the way I've seen this done well is where the central IRB, um, in collaboration with the sponsor, either has access to some of the site selection information or there is a separate uh, survey or questionnaire that asks about these very specific kind of issues of local contacts, questions about how do you credential, how do you, you know, um, what is your approach on, on this kind of uh, surgical procedure, that kind of thing, um, that really become, uh, you know, so that the, the IRB, when, when reviewing that, understands that Hospital A in California and Hospital B in New York do things differently, but at the end of the day, um, it doesn't really, does or does not impact human research protections, I think that's really important. And so it gets to kind of the communication strategy on how do you collect that information. And a good central IRB, whether commercial or institutional, is going to have some way to assess the um, environment on the ground, if you will, whether it's through a formal survey or some other, um, you know, communication strategy. Um, I can tell you, my institution, we have a, a form that we send out to those institutions that want to rely on us, um, and we ask these very specific questions, and we ask, we also ask for them to send us copies of their policies and procedures and their SOPs and, and things around those issues so that 
when our IRB reviews for, let's say, um, an organization in the Dakotas, that we understand what's happening on the ground in the Dakotas. And if there is anything different, that we understand what those differences are and, um, you know, and how to take them into account. I think Great, thank you. In terms of certain aspects, there are, um, devices, depending on how devices are, are classified, I mean, it could be a, um, a, a piece of equipment or, or an implant as, or implanted um, device in a, in a human. And I think um, it's, it's probably much more um, the, the invasiveness of the, the institutional review. Um, I think this is where that local contact, local review has been more of institutional resources and capability of um, doing that particular research trial at their, at their site. So um, I think it, there's a big spe spectrum of what, how things are classified as devices. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to change um, courses here a little bit. So we talked a lot about central IRBs, but they may not be uh, appropriate in all cases. Can you provide an example where a central IRB may not be appropriate? Uh, yeah, so this is this is sitting on. Um, yeah, I can definitely think of, of a couple of cases where, where central IRBs uh, may not be appropriate. Um, you know, I think... I think there are times when uh, it calls for kind of that local local contact. So you could kind of see a situation where if you had a device that was so innovative that the only people who really understood it were the individuals who would actually be implementing the study, and you may have a very small group of those individuals. Um, or at times when the institutions that you are working with may have um, significant sort of risk in the game, if you will. So, um, you know, a shared risk model where um, where perhaps you're, you're co-developing something with an institution and um, that institution, you know, the institutional expertise really only exists at that institution. Um, and that institution is taking on a certain degree of risk. I could see institutions in that situation saying, yeah, no, a central IRB isn't going to work for us. Um, you may also have situations where um, uh, times when, uh, you know, we, we, very specific subpopulations that, um, you know, are very rare um, or where, where there really are significant cultural differences between different uh, different groups or organizations and where local contacts really really does make a significant difference. But but those are, you know, in the 80-20 rule, I'd even say it's 90-10. I mean, those those are pretty rare. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's I don't very know helpful. Thank you. Way. Sorry, say again? No, I was going to say, I don't know if anybody on the call feels very differently, but but in our experience, we think that that's, that's pretty rare. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Well, we're coming close to the top of the hour here, and I want to respect everybody's time. Uh, again, thank you to Cindy and Sue for an excellent presentation today. And this is uh, one of many collaborations that we've undertaken now with City, and we're very excited to partner with City. And you can see that they're doing some excellent work. So thank you all for attending our MDICX webinar today, and have a great afternoon. Thanks so much.